Hello, everybody. For our second quick lecture of the week, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of social media as well as some important definitions. Social media is something we're probably using a lot more of lately now that we're all stuck at home. Uh, and I think it's important if we're going to talk about the history of social media and social networking that we have a working definition of what these things actually mean. Because they're kind of abstract ideas that get talked about as being one and the same. There is social media, the platform, the product, the companies that provide these outlets for us. And then there's the process of actually using social media or of using social networking online. So, like I always do, let's start with Wikipedia for our definition since they do a really good job. Uh, Wikipedia defines social media as social media are interactive computer-mediated technologies that facilitate the creation or sharing of information, ideas, career interests, and other forms of expression via virtual communities and networks. Now, this is a, a pretty long, fancy definition, but you get a good sense of what it means uh, to be social media, right? That it's all about the facilitation of creation or sharing info and ideas. And that this sort of last word at the bottom, the last word in the definition is the one we're going to focus on, which is the idea of the network. We can look at research that points to the idea that social media and social networks are sort of two different things, that the social media is the higher level, it is the product that can deliver the social network to us, but it's the network, it's the, the way that people interact and connect with each other on these sites that acts as kind of the, the DNA of social media. It is the foundation on which the rest of it is built. And if we look at, again, the Wikipedia definition for a social networking service, or an SNS as they are sometimes called, we see that it says, quote, a social networking service, also social networking site or social media, is an online platform which people use to build social networks or social relationship with other people who share similar personal or career interest activities, backgrounds, or real life connections. And you can see that the definition is similar, that even name drops the idea of social media in the definition of social networking. But they are sort of two different things, that social networking is the is the process involved and social media is the final product involved. A researcher by the name of Dana Boyd, who legally has her name lowercase, just so you know that's not a typo, uh, came up with a working definition uh, for social networks as they were starting to get very big and popular. Uh, Dana Boyd had the idea of, hey, we ought to have a working definition so that when we research and study this stuff, we're all talking about the same thing. And so the three steps of the Dana Boyd definition of social network is step one, you can make a public or semi-public profile. So you're allowed to have a page that is yours or have an account that is yours that you can customize and make your own. You can put a picture of yourself. You can describe what you like. You can describe the books you like to read and the movies you like to watch and the video games you like to play. You can, you can make it all about you. Step two, you can form a list of connections. So there's other people that you can choose to follow or be friends with or see the kind of stuff they're posting, see the kind of stuff that they repost. Uh, so it allows you to have that connection. And then finally, step three. This is a, one of the steps that we tend to forget about when we talk about social networking and social media is that step three, you can see who the people you are connected to are connected to. And the easiest way to describe that is saying that you can see your friends' friends. And that's important because we would need the ability to have that, to have a social network reach far enough out to connect to be successful. This is from some research I've done a long time ago. Uh, this is actually a visual visualization of my own Facebook network where the color coding represents how I know certain groups of people. So, for example, I believe the uh, light blue here were people who worked in journalism who I know, and people uh, with the red dots are people who went to undergrad with me that I know. Because I went to undergrad for journalism and then worked in journalism afterwards, these two groups are pretty well connected with each other. But in order for this network to spread and exist, there needs to be ways to connect the two. If you'll notice, you've got lots of dots between the purple over here and the light blue over here that connect everything. Another researcher who worked a lot with Dana Boyd named Nicole Ellison uh, has this really wonderful quote 
uh, from a piece of research that says Facebook is used to maintain existing offline relationships or solidify offline connections as opposed to meeting new people. So the basic idea of this is that social networking and social media sites, we tend to use them to maintain existing friendships and we don't tend to use them to make new friendships. And when we do, we actually end up thinking about those friendships that are based only on social networking connections as being different to us. We, we hold them in our heads differently than uh, when it is an existing relationship we're just using Facebook to maintain. And there's another quote that Boyd and Ellison have found or have, have uh, used a lot in their research that I really like, which is that the reason why social networking and social media sites have been so popular is that they give us the capacity to write ourselves into being. We get to put the best version of ourselves on social media, right? We don't put the all the embarrassing stuff or the stuff that makes us sad. We, we tend to show the best version of ourselves. That doesn't mean that we are treating the entire thing like advertising or public relations the whole time. But it does mean that we are careful about what we put there. We tend to put things that make us look good. And we tend to ignore stuff or not post stuff that makes us look bad. So where do all these sites come from? That's the, the big step here. Uh, so we need to get in our time machine and we need to go back a little bit to try to find the first instance of a, something that fits that definition. Uh, we can start off with stuff like early internet forums, uh, early Usenet groups. Um, they had ways of connecting with people, but there was no central page that was just yours that you could customize. There was also chatting systems. So some of you may remember AOL Instant Messenger. Uh, that had a way of having a profile that was yours and connecting, but you couldn't really see what other people were connecting to as well. You couldn't see who other people had on their AOL Instant Messenger list. And if you were really nerdy, you may have been involved in IRC chats. Uh, IRC is Internet Relay Chat. Um, and again, you didn't really have a page that was yours, although you could interact with a lot of people. Now, some of the early first couple of things we can look at on the Internet and say, yeah, this was probably social networking or social media before uh, you could call it social media or social networking were early dating websites like Match.com. But the only issue with those in terms of fitting in with the definition is you couldn't really see who anybody else matched with. So if person A matched with person B on this dating website, it wouldn't tell person A who else person B has matched with. That would kind of make them feel bad in terms of being on a dating site. So even though it gets really close, these early dating sites just don't count as being social media and they don't really count as being a social network. Now, we need to get to 1997 before we can get the first social networking slash social media site uh, that we could really uh, for sure say fits within the definition. And to me, that is a little bit crazy, right? Like 1997 feels like such a long time ago. It feels like it's an entirely different internet than what we have now. And there was social networking happening back then. So back in 1997, a developer named Andrew Weinreich, there he is pictured on the right there, had a thought. Like, what if you made a site that operated like a dating site, but wasn't actually for dating? Like, what if you took the idea of a dating website where you have a profile and you put information about yourself on it and you connect to other people, but you take all the pressure away from saying that it's just about dating? What if you take all the pressure away from saying that this is about um, connecting to people for lasting romantic relationships and you just make it about being friends with people? And so he developed a site called Six Degrees. Uh, there is the logo for Six Degrees, and it is the very first social media slash social networking site. Now, no one really knows about it today, and there's a good reason for that. At its height, it only managed to get about 3 million users, which seems like a lot, but if you compare it to pretty much any startup nowadays, 3 million isn't really anything. And not only that, but you have to have a certain amount of people on a social media site to be creating enough content to post to get other people to connect and interact with each other. And the idea was that at 3 million, there just wasn't enough people there to fully connect with each other. And so by the year 2000, by the new millennium, 
Uh, they ended up shutting down. Um, they were never able to freely find a good full audience. They were just around a little bit too early. Little did they know where social media was going to go after the year 2000. And like I said, the, the front page of the site is still there. You could go over to the internet and type in 6degrees.com, uh, and it'll show you the front page of the site, but the front page of the site has been the same uh, for quite a while now. If you try to log in or sign in, it won't let you. Uh, so it's kind of just a time capsule for how things used to be on the internet. And so for about two years of human existence on the internet, the world was once again without a social networking site. Uh, except not really. There was actually another site that technically qualifies as a social networking site that just gets completely forgotten about when we talk about the history of this stuff. In 1999, there was a blogging site that was started by a guy named Brad Fitzpatrick, uh, and it was called Live Journal. I don't know how many of you have ever used or are familiar with Live Journal, but back in the early 2000s, it was a pretty cool place to be. Uh, and it had the idea sort of played around with the idea of letting people string their blogs together by friending. So you would start a blog, and it would be your little blog page, and then you would friend other blogs, and sort of like a Facebook account now, but instead of it being your personal Facebook page, it would be your blog. But I think because it's a blog, not purely a profile-style account, its rightful place in history as being one of the first uh, long-term social networking sites kind of gets lost. It, it's, its overall picture in this story is a little blurry. Uh, LiveJournal is still very much around, but it is owned by a weird Russian company nowadays, and I wouldn't recommend going to check it out um, just because I have heard a lot about malware being on the site and it kind of being sketchy now. Okay, Flash forward to the first of our real, true, pure social networking sites that manages to be successful, unlike Six Degrees. In 2002, a coder named Jonathan Abrams gets the idea to make a dating-style website, but instead of normal dating site questions, you would just post whatever you want to about yourself, and you could connect with other people. At the time, Abrams thought this was a really original idea, without considering the fact that Six Degrees had come up with it uh, quite a bit earlier than they did. And that's one of the fun things about researching the recent history of technological developments, particularly on the internet out of Silicon Valley. Everyone invents stuff that they think they're the first one to invent. In reality, they were almost always beat to the punch. So, Jonathan Abrams' idea is this social networking site, which he calls Friendster. If we were meeting in person, I would ask how many of you ever had even heard of Friendster before. Pretty much none of you would raise your hand because you just weren't old enough back then. Uh, and I would feel really old. So at the very least, having uh, coronavirus spread around so that we can't meet in person means that I get to save myself from that embarrassment of feeling really old. So this was basic Friendster, what you're looking at here. Uh, and Friendster looks a lot like, well, early social networking sites. You put a picture of yourself, you put your detailed information, you put stuff about your hobbies, and you connect with other people. And it's a, a pretty rapid thing. It, it, it succeeds really fast. Uh, it quickly grows to a million users within the first month and then surpasses 5 million users by the end of the first year. Because it was able to jump to 5 million so fast, uh, there are times now where 5 million is seen as sort of the minimum amount of people you need on a social networking site in order for it to be successful. But some bad things are about to happen to poor old Friendster. Uh, Friendster as you can guess by it not being around today, uh, did meet an unfortunate end. One of the things that happened to Friendster is that people wanted to branch out and make other accounts. People wanted to make accounts for their dog or their cat. They wanted to make an account for their band that they played in garages with. They, they wanted to make stuff that was fake celebrities. They wanted to be funny with their Friendster accounts. And the moderators for the site were very strictly against it. It was the idea that, hey, Friendster is for making friends. You better not make one for your pet or your band because this is for human beings to interact with other human beings. And that kind of upset people. It also had a problem of non-reciprocal friending. Uh, the best way of describing non-reciprocal friending is that it's more like the Twitter model than the Facebook model. If you think about how Twitter works, you can follow somebody else, but that other person doesn't have to follow you back. That's called non-reciprocal friending. 
Facebook has reciprocal friending, where if I friend you, that automatically means, if you agree to it, that you friend me back. It is a one-for-one. One. And while Twitter can get away with non-reciprocal friending because it's so big nowadays, back in the really early days of social networking and social media, uh, non-reciprocal friending led to a lot of drama. It led to a lot of falling out between people where I would friend you, but you wouldn't friend me back, and then I took that as a personal slight, and I got really mad at you and maybe called you names. Another one of the reasons why Friendster ended up running into a lot of trouble is there were these constant, persistent hoaxes that would spread throughout the site, uh, which was free. It didn't cost any money to use Friendster. Uh, that the site was about to start charging money for people to have a profile. They would be uh, chain letter style posts that people would post and they would get sort of spiral out of control that, oh my gosh, Friendster is going to start charging you $5 or $10 to maintain a profile. Now, these rumors and these hoaxes were, on one hand, entirely unfounded. Friendster had no plans to charge money for access to the site. On the other side of things, the idea itself wasn't entirely unprecedented because a lot of early dating websites on the internet did charge money to maintain a profile. And then in 2003, which seems like gosh, so long ago now, a competition finally shows up for, uh, for Friendster, a site to compete against it, and that site, as you may have been guessing, was MySpace. Uh, MySpace was... Uh, Really one of the first social networking sites to get massively, massively big. While Friendster was still popular, Friendster never got as big as MySpace would eventually get. And MySpace made good on a lot of the problems Friendster was undergoing. Uh, MySpace decided that they would allow anyone to make accounts for anything. If you had a band, you could make an account for that band. If you had a, a dog that with a funny face, you could make an account for that dog with a funny face. You could make accounts for fake celebrities. You could make uh, a, an account for parody that was parody-based, right? You could do everything on there that they wouldn't let you do over on Friendster. They also were really mean about the rumors and hoaxes going on around Friendster. One of the things they would do is any time that one of those, hey, Friendster's going to make you start paying to have an account, hoaxes would go around on Friendster, MySpace would post a press release on the front of their site that would promise that the product that MySpace would always remain free to use. They never mentioned Friendster, but it was always sort of a wink and a nod of, hey, if you're worried that this hoax over on Friendster might be true and they're going to start charging money for it, well... Uh, better come over to MySpace because we'll never charge any money. There's a lot of unfounded rumors uh, as well that's kind of fun that MySpace was actually the ones posting the hoaxes on Friendster to start with, but those, again, have never really been proven. And as you can imagine, this really hurts Friendster. Friendster shuts down for a while in the late 2000s because everyone moved from Friendster over to MySpace. It did reopen way later in 2011, but it didn't reopen as a social networking site. It reopened as a kind of sketchy Malaysian-owned social game site that had stuff that was meant to compete with, uh, with Farmville-style games on Facebook. Uh, it wasn't terribly popular, and it did shut down in 2015. Uh, this is the way that the front site, uh, the site will look if you go there now on Friendster. Uh, it just has a little post-it note thing about how they've shut down on. Uh, June 14th, 2015. This also was a really big bummer for people like me who research social networking sites because when they flipped everything over to the social gaming stuff and then shut everything down, everything is now locked behind this, this uh, front page, which means that we'll never get a chance to research early Friendster days and how people used social networking sites uh, like them again, which is kind of a bummer. So back to our main story. MySpace becomes a massive cultural phenomenon. Everything like who's going to be in your top list of friends on the site becomes a really big deal. Uh, it becomes a, a cultural thing. People were selling MySpace t-shirts and Hot Topic, which now that I say that out loud is the most mid-2000s thing uh, sentence that's ever been said. So MySpace becomes a massive cultural phenomenon. It eventually sells to News Corp, as we know from previous Lessons in this class are the primary owners of uh, the Fox News Company uh, in 2006 for a whopping $580 million. Unfortunately, as we probably all know, 
uh, bad things are on the horizon for MySpace. Just like how MySpace stepped in and really hurt Friendster, there's another site that's about to step in and really hurt MySpace, and that site, as we know, is Facebook. Facebook stepped in and was everything that MySpace wasn't because it made itself exclusive and cool. Initially, you had to have a .edu email address to be on uh, Facebook, so it, it it had this air of exclusivity that it was you were a cool college kid if you had a Facebook account, and then it just spirals out of control from there. But more on Facebook in a second. Eventually, MySpace, after having its lunch completely eaten by Facebook. Uh, they end up selling the company in 2011 for only $35 million, which, if you consider how much they bought it for, was an absurd loss on their behalf. Uh, so they sell MySpace in 2011. They actually sell it to a group of investors that was led by Justin Timberlake, who was a very big believer in MySpace and thought he could relaunch it. Uh, and he did relaunch it. It had a brand new layout. It was way more music focused and music friendly. They tried to cater a lot to bands uh, and musicians and make it about booking gigs and, and demoing new material. And it was somewhat popular, but it never really took off. Uh, eventually, his group of investors sold it to Time Incorporated, who sold it to Meredith, who is the media company that currently owns it now. And if you've never heard of Meredith, it's because... Uh, we haven't taught them because they're not one of the very large giant media companies. And so that brings us to where we are today. Nobody has yet toppled Facebook. Um, there are other popular social networking sites. There's Twitter, there's Snapchat, there's TikTok is increasingly popular, but they don't have the same numbers that Facebook has. And part of that is because Facebook has proven to be an absolutely ruthless tech company uh, even in an era of really ruthless tech companies. Uh, if Facebook faces a company that it sees as some sort of competition, they have taken two routes. One is to just buy the competition. So when Instagram launched, uh, there was a lot of worry with Facebook that Instagram was going to steal their business because most people, when you ask them, say that they maintain their Facebook site primarily because there's a lot of pictures and images that are already hosted excuse me, hosted there, and they don't want to have to move them. So Instagram was like, oh no, this is competition now, so Facebook just bought Instagram. Or they just start doing everything differently. Uh, Google, with all of its massive money, uh, launched Google Plus in the early 2010s uh, with some pretty radical ideas. Like you could select, uh, you could be very selective about who could see certain stuff you posted. So if you wanted to post pictures of yourself playing uh, beer pong, but you didn't want your family to fuss at you, you could set it so that if you posted that, your family members wouldn't see it, only your close friends would see it. Facebook saw this as competition and essentially just redeveloped their entire site to look and act more like Google+. It Then if we think about uses and gratifications theory, made it so that there really wasn't a reason to have Google+, and Google+, Plus came crashing down. And Facebook... Although it certainly isn't hurting, Facebook is kind of plateaued at the moment. Like if we look at this chart, which is the percentage of the United States population over the age of 12 that has an account and uses Facebook, we can see that it peaks in 2017 with 67% and has decreased slightly from 62% to 61% up to last year in 2019. Uh, and if we look at what is causing that plateau, it is primarily younger people. It's primarily people ages 12 to 34 that are decreasing their, their overall usage of the site. People age 35 to 54 and then people age 55 and over are actually sort of the same, if not slightly higher on the site. It's, it's mostly young people not using the site as much. So there is a question about Facebook's future moving forward. Have they developed themselves into a system where they're almost like print newspapers, where they're preferred by an older generation. And as that older generation leaves, are we going to see a decrease finally in Facebook's power? Although, just so we're clear, this is a very sort of Western-centric approach to looking at social networking. There are other sites that in other parts of the world have gotten really big, uh, although it's not all of them are still around, uh, Orcut being one of them. Uh, if I'm pronouncing that wrong, I apologize. It was originally a social networking site developed in the mid to early 2000s by Google. 
Uh, and it never got popular in the United States. It never really got popular anywhere except for Brazil. But for some reason, for reasons no one can fully explain, it became the dominant uh, social networking site in Brazil for a really long time. Uh, up until probably the mid-2010s, uh, or early 2010s, uh, it did better numbers in terms of site traffic than Facebook did. Eventually, Google realized it couldn't keep paying to keep this one social network site running just because it was popular in one country, and they did eventually shutter the thing uh, in the mid-2010s. Also, China, based on it being under a much more protected form of internet in China, uh, has different social networking sites. So Weibo and Renren are both very popular social networking sites in China. We don't really use them much in the United States, um, but uh, they are still very popular in other parts of the world. And funny enough, if we circle everything back to that, uh, circle everything back to six degrees, it turns out there's actually a patent that was filed in January 17th, 1997 for the patent called Methods and Apparatus for Constructing a Networking Database and System. It essentially is the patent for having a social media site or a social networking site. And uh, this is a very powerful patent because essentially Facebook, Twitter, everything that we use now is based on the availability of this patent. And because of the importance of the patent, the owners of LinkedIn and Zynga both pitched in together to buy uh, that patent and keep it buried partially so that uh, people would not be constantly suing each other over if you're allowed to have a social networking site or not, or if it would be patent infringement and you would owe money to the owners of six degrees. So that concludes our quick lesson on the history and definitions of social networking sites.